Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. This podcast is presented by Blockworks Group, the only blockchain event and media production company I trust. For exclusive content and events, that provide insight into the crypto and blockchain space, visit them at blockworksgroup.io. I promise you won't be disappointed. Hey all, I'm Charlie Shrem. Some of you may know me for having started BitInstant, a company that was at one point one of the largest in the crypto space, and where most people bought their first Bitcoin from 2011 to 2014. Others may know me from the time I spent in prison. I've been in this space longer than most, But none of that is the point. Here's the deal. Every day, hundreds of new users, developers, founders, and investors come into this emerging space. And while new things like custody and futures markets are always grabbing the headlines, it's important for these new folks to understand the history of this space, how this movement really came to be. I've partnered with the Blockworks Group to develop a show that will dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders. Rather than focusing on the now, I will speak with the movers and shakers of the past decade in crypto to uncover the stories of the movement that you have never heard before. One might call these untold stories. So sit back, relax, and enjoy these untold stories. Before I do every episode, there's always some research that that goes in before uh, I bring on a guest. And sometimes I sit and talk and you guys get bored of that. And a lot of times I bring on guests. And what's interesting about my next guest is we've interacted on numerous occasions, uh, offline, online, in person. Um, my next guest actually um, has done fireside chats with me and I thought they were fantastic. But what's interesting is that it's very difficult to find information about my next guest. He doesn't do a lot of podcasts. He doesn't do a lot of shows. And usually when you Google his name, you'll see over 10,000 interviews that he's done of other people. So now we're going to turn the tables and we're going to ask this fine gentleman some questions. Allow me the, the honor of introducing my guest today, Pete Rizzo, Editor-in-Chief of Coindesk, an all-around fantastic guy. Welcome to the show, Pete. Thank you for coming on the show. Hey, what's up, Charlie? Appreciate you having me, and uh, thanks for the uh, flattering introduction. I like to butter my guests up a little bit before I get to the tough questions. Yeah, that's how you open. That's how you open, right? <laughs> that's Well, if I start mean, then you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to be all guarded. Yeah, you can just turn the camera right off. <laughs> is that is that – so, I mean, all these strategies, like you probably – know these strategies uh, so you do at this point you're you do some of the journalism but you're mostly um doing editorial work at coindesk right yeah uh, what's the landscape of crypto media today and i'm going to get into some of the past stuff but i'm interested in uh, how do you see you know coindesk is what do you compare your what do you compare coindesk to in the traditional mainstream media world are you like a new york times or you're more of a wall street journal and everyone's kind of like under you um where do you see that <laughs> Yeah, I can I can hop, hop in on that. So, I mean, that's something I think about a lot, right? So, kind of going on to your theme of, you know, where I came in in the industry. I think, um, you know, one of the things that's unique about me is I've, I'm the longest tenure person at Coindesk, but I really wasn't a part of the founding team. You know, I was sort of on the periphery of that. Um, but I was really, I think, able as like a young journalist or somebody who wanted to do media, sort of understand what the Coindesk brand was getting right and like what the opportunity was. And I think, um, you know, this goes to a lot of my like thoughts on crypto generally. It's it's like uh, really hard to describe things in the short and medium term. And like oftentimes you end up with these like weird convoluted analogies. Um, so I like to look at Coindesk within the lens of like Wired magazine, which, again, it sounds like really like highfalutin. Like, uh, but that's more long form content once a month. Well, so I mean, like, if you were to ask me, like, what Coindesk Spirit Animal is, like, in terms okay. of, like another like publication, honey badger. <laughs> um, well, that may be my mascot, but I guess like in terms of like you know what we aspire to, right? You know, the thing that I think Wired really got right was that, you know, if you look at 1994 Wired magazine, like, uh, you know, they were like one of the first 
media companies to have a website, right? Like, because they wrote about websites and prior to uh, having a website about websites, they were a magazine. So, you know, Wired is a really interesting thing in that it was a publication. It was about a medium that like it really couldn't use initially. And one of the interesting things is they kind of like just expanded that brand over time, right? So like, you know, in 1992, they like wrote about mouse pads, like a bunch of weird crap like that, like nobody cares about today. And I love over mouse pads. time, what'd you say? I love mouse pads. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm mouse padless right now. But you know, they Dude, if I was at Starbucks and some guy pulled out a mouse pad, <laughs> with his laptop, I would give him a high five, <laughs> especially one with like a picture of his cat on it or something. Yeah, you know, there was a whole market for that. But that's like an inter- other interesting thing. You know, we can talk about that, which is just, you know, like these bubbles that come with technology, right? Like most pads are like a kind of goofy thing that like, you know, for a while was like a big moneymaker. But uh, like kind of going back to like uh, Wired, you know, one of the things they were able to do is like, you know, you think of Wired magazine today, it's like a general interest publication today. And the reason that they think they were able to do that is sort of, you know, they grew with the technology and they evolved with the technology and they sort of like, you know, if you look at the curve. <laughs> from like 1990 to today it's like you know they evolved from kind of like a weird niche hobbyist thing to a mainstream thing because like digital is a lifestyle now but they've made mistakes and is that okay uh like well, i mean what's a mistake like i mean well, they've I called the death of bitcoin like five times <laughs> uh well yeah i mean i guess which major press uh, vehicle hasn't at this point um true, true story <laughs> so I get, but i guess it's okay for the media the media doesn't always need to be right is that okay like mm, how, so how does that work like media coverage of bitcoin um yeah, um, hmm, yeah, that's a tough one. So I think media outlets are like designed to do certain things in like certain ways, and they don't yield themselves. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So I talk a lot to like journalism classes, like so recruiting people for like Coinbase internship program, which is like something I'm really happy about and don't really talk a lot about. That would be a fantastic internship if anyone's listening. That would be great. Yeah. I would love it. And we're still accepting applications. But, um, you know, one of the things that I do say is that, um, you know, uh, journalism tends to be biased towards like the existing status quo, like often in like confusing ways. So, like a good example would be like, you know, one of the first questions I get from most journalists about cryptocurrencies is about regulation, which is like pretty dumb because not because regulation isn't important and it's not like a thing that society has agreed on that has utility. It's just dumb because... Uh, there's just more things you could focus on, right? So I did a panel at like um, some UN kind of thing with Mike Casey like a couple years ago. And I and I was like pleading with the journalist. I was like, don't, don't ask about regulation. I was like, you should be asking about like, you know, journalists kind of often like through the lens of like needing to feel objective or feeling like they're critical, like they adopt a stance where they like question things from the lens of the existing status quo. And like, you can do that or you can be like, wow, this technology is like legitimately amazing. Like it's like, you know, Bitcoin I feel like good journalists are the ones that don't adopt stances in advance though. Yeah, I, let I think the article speak for great. themselves. Ask difficult questions, but let the article speak for themselves. Yeah, I guess it's it's so it's 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 not always about the articles. Like, and so I guess maybe to like name a specific name, but I think it's like very useful. So, but Nathaniel Popper is like someone who I think like most people are familiar with. I think he does a really good job with like stories where it's like he's breaking a, like a new piece of information, like with his Facebook story, right? Like, obviously that's like high value news, like it's reported pretty well. I think like even he kind of like struggles with these sort of like you know how do I have you... to push back though on that because he he broke the story of my Winklevoss case uh, yeah. and and he got a lot of the details wrong yeah. and when I had emailed him and my attorneys emailed him um, he wouldn't even adjust it like basic stuff mm-hmm. like he wrote that I had two Maseratis and that that was completely wrong he wrote that two boats yeah, three, and right? that was completely wrong just basic basic due diligence yeah. and the thing was is he got that due diligence from their complaint Mm. so he wouldn't do his own research and say hey i'm gonna take their word for it because they seem like credible people instead of Mm. taking their word for it i think a good journalist would have done his own research instead of taking their side for things yeah so like journalism is hard right so um he's written a book about me so i have a lot of history with nathaniel yeah, so I guess the way, well, you know, maybe I don't want to talk like specifically about what he should or shouldn't have done there. I don't I don't think that that's really like uh, my place. But I, I again, I would, I would say like, you know, journalism is one of the things that's been like most affected by technology. And I don't think it's adapted very well. Um, we can kind of like maybe get into that. But sort of what I was talking about with, um, uh, you know, like talking to kids about uh, in journalism about blockchain technologies and things like that, you know, um, I think like like an interesting analogy like is publishing, right? So the things you're talking about with journalism, it's like um, real time information dissemination from like so many places in the world. Um, you know, it really wasn't made like for the internet, right? Like we had this like old system where we sort of like journalists were allowed to sit with information and then they were published it like in a piece of paper, right? Um, 
so I think what you're saying with Daniel Popper is just like sort of or your specific personal experience is just sort of like akin to a larger problem, which is that, um, you know, and this is why I think when you talk about like blockchain, cryptocurrency journalism, it's so complex. It's like, well, journalism is an industry like that has its own issues that are like totally separate from cryptocurrency journalism. And then like cryptocurrency journalism as like a niche of that, like has its other own issues. Like, and they're, they're kind of like separate things. But So are the issues of the crypto media industry the same as the mainstream media industry? Well, the mainstream media is industry's problems. They don't, don't know how to fucking pay for anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they're, well, and, and like, so I say this to like journalists, like when I talk at these classes and like, uh, one of the things I say is like, journalists should like most innately understand like what blockchains are going to do. Because like, if you think about the old publishing model, it was sort of like you had a consolidated newspaper. Like we, like journalists talked to sources, they published information, they controlled the distribution network, right? So they like controlled the paper boys and the trucks and everything that like distri distributed the information and they benefited from all the revenue from that network that they had, right? And so blockchains, if you look at them, it's like, okay, well, banks sort of turn into like old school journalism companies in that like, you know, today it's like they control the dissemination of the thing. They own the network in terms of like being able to funnel this cash to these banks. And they sort of like monetize all that activity. And what you're talking about with blockchain is a migration to a platform. And like the thing that like, uh, you know, I, I'm actually surprised I haven't seen like people use this model a lot because I think, I, I think it means a lot. It's like, it's like media outlets were dramatically impacted by like, you know, information, moving free information. Forward. Yeah. And I think when you're talking about free money with blockchains and cryptocurrencies, it's like, you're talking about the same thing. It's like the existing players will now have to compete on the platform. So one of the things I often talk about is like, you know, the PewDiePie of money. It's like, you know, in the future state you have, then, you know, today you have the New York times, Trump and sure. PewDiePie. And in the future you'll have JP Morgan, whatever the Trump equivalent, the PewDiePie equivalent is, because they're all competing on the same network. Right. So it's like, everything kind of returns to this network. But I think journalists, like, they don't think of it that way. I'm like, I, I, I kind of continue to like... No, because it's like, the business. It's the business side of things. Why would they need to think about that stuff? Yeah, true. And I, and I think that's, like, one of the things that's uniquely kind of shaped my experience is, like, having to deal with, like, you know, one of the untold stories, like, about Coindesk is just, like, you know, historically what a, like, tragic business would have been, um, you know, just in terms of, like, you know, the original iteration of Coindesk failed, like, not because it was a bad product. It was just, like, a, you know... It, well, I want to hear... I want to hear about that. Um, but I want to... I also want to make one comment um so i i pay for some media and i wanted to ask you what are your thoughts on this so i don't pay for like wall street journal i don't pay for new york times and i do read some articles and they give you free ones but it's enough for me um i pay for two hyper local papers in my town in, in, in southwest florida i pay for like the sarasota observer and i pay for like the sarasota herald tribune which is like eight dollars a month or something like that. And i pay and i i gladly pay for that because it's super hyper local information that is difficult to get. For example, I live on an island and the, the city hall has a meeting about they're building new sidewalks on the island or they're they're, you know, uh, dredging sand to add 100 yards of more sand on the beaches. And I need to know this stuff because it affects my daily life. Mm. The new recycling carts are, lay, are rolling out, for example. Mm. But there's no one covering this stuff except for the super hyper hyper local journalists and papers and they're going to these meetings and then at the same time, if I'm not going to pay that $8, then who will? And then how am I going to get that information? Because I'm not going to the meeting myself. Yeah, I think that's the tough thing about journalism. I mean, I, I think your experience is great. Like, I'm glad that you do that. It's like, I try to do that myself, um, you know, in terms of like reading local papers. I think local journalism is a distinct flavor. I mean, you know, online journalism today is like, you know, this totally weird thing that is, uh, you know, it's like a weird aberration of the attention economy that the internet created. Um, you know, so you have all these things like that are just designed to like cannibalize people's attention on social media and stuff. And that's why I'm saying it's like, sure. you know, when you look at the media landscape, it's almost like, you know, or cryptocurrency media in general, it's, I, I think like people too, like myopically focus on cryptocurrency journalism as like this thing that's totally separate from this other failing business model. And it's like not. So there's, <laughs> like, there's a new, uh, know, there's, a, there's a new site that I, that I read about. Um, and I, I never saw, I didn't pay for it yet, but I, I'm feeling like I'm willing to do it. It's called the information.com. Oh yeah. Yeah. I know the information. Yeah. Sure. I, I like it because their, their stuff is also extremely specific and they really, it seems like they spend a lot of time on their, wow. on their, on their, uh, on their work. Yeah. Look, I think that's great. I mean, I think the information has an interesting model. I mean, they're mostly focused similar on to Coindesk there. research, right? Uh, well, I think like we don't really, you know, we've kind of struggled with research, I think. I think research is like a hard model in cryptocurrencies because you just have such a tremendous amount of like free information and like, you know, the sort of crypto hive mind is sort of always collecting stuff. Um, 
you know, so I think like, you know, we sort of did these state of blockchain reports. We're kind of not doing that much anymore. Um, you know, I'd like to see research come back, but again, like, I think, you know, part of like building a business is like figuring out where people are like well served already. Right. And I think like the crypto, you know, I call it like the hive mind because that's like kind of what it is. Right. And you know, it's like the people who write on medium all the time. There's like a huge economy of like people doing that stuff. Um, so, okay. So what was the original iteration of Coindesk and how yeah. has that changed? Oh uh, yeah. That's an interesting question. Um, when did so, it start? Give us the history of Coindesk for people that don't know. How did you get involved? Yeah. And sure. How did that all play out? Um, well, funny, fun fact, like the first Coindesk article I ever wrote was about a vegan restaurant in Boston that accepted um, cryptocurrencies. <laughs> so, <Is it> good? <laughs> I, I don't even think it exists anymore, but, uh, uh. you know, I just, I, I would actually have to dig it up. There was like a lot of like long, long story there, but, um, you know, I don't know. It was very quaint. Like, right. You know, like if you look back, like, you know, the, the early 2013 days, um, you know, so Coindesk was originally founded by this guy named Shaquille Khan. He was the, you know, Shaq. Yeah, Shaq. He was at a product at Spotify. He was an early investor in, um, you know, BitPay and a lot of cryptocurrency industry businesses. Um, you know, his thesis was essentially there was no good place to get information about cryptocurrencies. So he made, made Coindesk. Um, and the idea that I guess that that was going to help him, like, try to invest in things and or just it would help the industry to grow and mature. Um, so, you know, the, you know, the original model was sort of like you had your news and then we launched the Bitcoin price index, which was sort of like the first reference for the price because, like, you know, we were sort of sleeping with alarms all over the, the all over the place. Place, trying to like wake up when the bitcoin price moved we were like okay well we'll just like make a thing on the site so, so we don't like constantly publish articles every time like bitcoin goes up or down like 50 or 100 dollars but um you know they brought me and i was the first u.s hire it was a uk based company um but you know the strategy there was basically like you know they, we, we put a bunch of money into a, a free media service essentially and then the idea was to like kind of quickly flip it to like people who knew about media uh that didn't work we basically didn't monetize at all through 2013 or 2014 14, so we basically like captured no money and then like 2015 like we were able to get venture capital so basically you know what it turned into was like a group of people that sat around for two years like actually earned no money and like hadn't created a business <laughs> and basically like in a down market had to figure out a way to do that and we made consensus which is like a really like smart iteration right like so we found like we, we decided like okay well we bring two people together digitally through our content and like we're gonna bring people together physically through like event which is consensus um, so we launched that and it was like big success, but like, you know, it came from a lot of failures and like one of the failures I think with Coindesk 1.0 was it was sort of like predicated on the idea that the Bitcoin price would like keep increasing, which I think a lot of businesses were like, most businesses are doing that. In fact, the whole industry is based on that and it still is. Yeah, it still is. Um, still is. It's so, Bitcoin it's is so built to continue to appreciate over di or die completely. Um, it has to appreciate over time. Um, Have you been thinking at all, like one of the things that like, I'll just like kind of throw out there that's been really fascinating sure. with me lately is like, you know, the, 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 I wrote like an op-ed about like Binance like recently, cause I think they've done really well. It's just like so few businesses like like have found a way to like ride out cryptocurrency in terms of like investing at the right times. Like, so, you know, you think about it, it's like you really- Survival. Like, when, well, when was the best money, like, way, like, when was the best place to invest in the last bubble? It was obviously, like, early 2017, right? Like, you had a massive ability to scale. You had massive influx of users. But I mean, if you look at all the crypto companies, it's like, well, they most of them invested at the top of 2018 <laughs> because they, like, you know, sort of fooled themselves into thinking this was... It's a very good point. You know, most of the companies have built and launched themselves in the bear market because they come up with the idea during a massive bull market. By the time they get their product out, it's right. already on the downturn. Right. And they miss and they, and they totally fail or die or whatever. Right. So I think, um, you know, original Coindesk was like built at the right time. We launched in 2013. We Even Coinbase was launched in a bear market. Uh, yeah. What? 2012? 2013. Yeah. It was right after the $36 bubble. Yeah. <laughs> that was, was a big one. I got market. wrecked on that one. <laughs> well, I bought it 32 and then it went down to two. Yeah. Yeah. Before my time, I came in around $50. I, I think I was like top of 2013. Like I remember, uh, I think the first thing I remember reading was like the Mt. Gox lawsuit with uh, CoinLab, which is like weirdly still a relevant thing today. It's still going on. <laughs> yeah. well, that's, that's how Peter Vesna stays relevant. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not going to go there, but I think uh, if you've been around long enough in cryptocurrency, it's, it's hard not to have ended up in someplace weird, I guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I had when I had founded the Bitcoin Foundation with with Peter and a few other guys, the original idea. So I have to tell you, it's like Coindex. The original idea for 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 the Bitcoin Foundation was so simple, and the idea came from literally me and Gavin sitting in a cafe in Austria. So we're sitting in a cafe in Austria. It's 2012, and I was like, Gavin, 
there's like six Bitcoin companies right now. There's like six of us, me, <laughs> BitPay. It was BitInstant, BitPay. This was before Coinbase. Uh, Bitstamp was one of them. Um, and I forget. There are a few other ones that don't exist anymore. And oh, it was Mount Gox was one of them. And then it was Roger. And I said, I said, Gavin, like for this thing to really succeed, we need to somehow like create an industry association, an industry association. It wasn't meant to speak on behalf of Bitcoin itself. It was meant to be an industry association. This was again the the original idea. Um, an industry association where we can allocate a certain amount of money per year to go towards advertising and messaging for the industry itself. And that was the original idea. But the problem was, is when Gavin said, we want, what about paying me and the other developers? And then I said, oh, that sounds like a great idea. And then Roger really liked that idea. And Mark Carpellis really liked that idea because we're trying to figure out a way to fund open source Bitcoin development. And that was where the, that's where it failed before it started. Because at that, up until that point, we were an industry spoken for um, association. Then after that, when we had launched, it became this not only uh, association, but it, became, it wanted to become this powerful organization that controlled like the future of crypto and take all this money. Mm. And then, and originally, it wasn't supposed to tell the developers what to do, but eventually it did. And 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 Peter kind of took that over. So originally, I was supposed to be chairman and control, not control, but I was supposed to be chairman and kind of lead. But I was I was young. I was like 21 years old and young and naive. And I admit that. And Peter came to me and he said, um, he said, well, listen, if you become vice chairman and let me become chairman, you can, you know, you can get a big speaking budget from the foundation and you can just run around and speak and you don't have to do anything. And I says, oh, it sounds great. It's like being the prince. No one wants to kill the prince. Everyone wants to kill the king, you know, I was like, sounds great. So that's kind of how it went down. But, but I feel like they kind of ran it into the ground. And I, I resigned in 2014 after I had been arrested, but. That's kind of where, where it went down. And I learned the hard way that what people say may not really be what they really I just mean. think like the thing that, yeah, I, I guess drawing on from my own experience is just like, you have to like really aggressively validate things. Like one of the things we got into with original Coindesk, it's like, you know, you sit around and you look at it now and it's like, oh, how could two people, how could like for two years you sit around at a company that it hasn't earned a single dollar and like think that's fine. And it's like, well, you know, you get into this pattern of like, you know, we're great because we're great and we're great because we're great and people love us because we're great. And there's no... You know, you sort of stop fall into like the cyclical thing. Like, like you don't like actually validate like whether you're actually like doing something of value and you're accruing value. How do you monetize greatness? Yeah, I, I, who knows, right? <laughs> like Donald Trump, I guess. Yeah, influencers do it. Yeah, but you can't be like in an article like, oh yeah, and this this I'm writing critically about this company, but this Pepsi I'm drinking is really fantastic. <laughs> I I mean maybe you could maybe that's not a bad idea though <laughs> maybe you could do that on the show right you can just like between questions you know just... <laughs> yeah product placement I probably will when I get some advertisers but my sales team is out there aggressively doing it yeah what else do you want to talk about can I tell you a story because like I you know so I've actually never told you about this I don't actually don't know if you tell remember this well so okay. So when you were uh, so we, when you went off to, to prison, right? You, My sabbatical. Yeah, well, you you asked Coindesk to like send you like the uh, like written like printed out version of Coindesk. Do you remember? I did. I okay. did. Yeah. Well, so like uh, so I was you know I was like my second year at Coindesk and like you know I was kind of in all in on the crypto thing and I remember you know we were sort of like talking about it. I'll, I'll just tell you my side of the story and like. I, what do you mean you were talking about it? Like, lay this out. Were you in a boardroom? And it's just like, hey, Charlie wants us to send well, like a- printed copies of Coindesk in prison. Well, there was like a Skype conversation. And like, people were just like, eh, like, I don't know, you know, whatever. And I was like, you know, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, this is like super cool. Like, I was like, I've never like been part of like a, like, thing that was like producing information or like writing machine that like was so relevant that this like you know this guy like wants to like us to print it off in jail like i was like and to me that just like blew my mind it was like one of the things that i still think about it's like well why did i stay at coindesk during the down like you know when it was like all those tough years and it's like you know because as a writer like someone who creates things it's like you want people to respond to those things right i spent like so many years like working at like shitty seo companies where i wrote a bunch of stuff like no one ever cared about and like to me, that was like the coolest thing. I was like, you know, oh, this guy has 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 asked us to do this, and like, yeah, like somebody should do that. That's like fucking great. Um, so personal side of that story is like, I, I feel so badly. Like I don't think I've ever told you this. Like I I only did that once. Like I only sent you like one packet. Uh, there's like a lot. I remember. Yeah, it. there's like a lot of reasons for that. A manila envelope. Oh, uh, yeah. There was like 80 pages of documents, right? So 
Uh, <laughs> it was epic. Thank you so much. I remember it. I'll never forget. I remember every letter, everything I ever got. In well, prison. I'm glad. I like one of my things is like I felt so badly that I didn't continue doing that. But like I want to tell you like a little bit why because it's uh, so you know during that time I was actually living in an RV with like a buddy. Like we were just like, kind of like traveling around the country and it was just like so hard for us to continually find places to like print all the stuff out. And then like Quinta started failing, and then it was the whole thing. And I just like anyway, I was like I did it once. Like I printed off the 80 articles. Like I felt really good about it. And then like I never did it again for you. And it's like. Where did you print it? Uh, I couldn't even tell you. It was like an Office Depot and like some. I was like like Oregon, I think I was. I think was oh, you should have told me that. That would have made it even so much better. <laughs> well, it's like now I get to tell you the story finally, which is that you know I I really wanted to do this. Like I felt good about doing this, and I felt so guilty for so long. And I was like ah, oh, like you know, like this guy asked us, like I did this one time, and like but you know, Coindesk was such a. You know, the thing is, like, you know, before we found consensus in the business model, it's just like, you know, one of the hard things with crypto journalism, I think, is like, you know, so it's a lot of it's based on VC money, right? Like, Coindesk now has the luxury of like, say what you will about the conferences, like, you know, whatever, you think about whatever you want. It's like, you know, we, we have the means to pay for our business, and that's great. But for a while, that like wasn't true. And, uh, you know, there was just, and that was like, that was like the peak of our existential crisis. And I don't know, I just wanted you to know that like, I feel, I felt so bad about that. And, uh, cause, cause again, I like, I, I appreciated it so much that you even like were asking that, you know, of course. And thank you so much for doing that. So that's not until it really, <laughs> no, it, it, it matters. Um, yeah. and it was really great. I remember. So let me tell you from the other side of the story. So here I am and Mail call in prison is one of the best parts of the day because it's your only communication from the outside world that's not um, – that is in context. And let me explain what I mean by that. You have you have two – you have three forms of communication from the outside world. And the first, to survive prison, you have to almost – you have to give up the idea that you can have instant gratification and instant communication from people. Right. It's a very difficult thing in the cell phone world to, to give up. Right. You have to understand that. You get 10 minutes a day of phone calls. So you have 300 minutes a month. That's 10 minutes a day. Now, I was just, I had my fiance, uh, who's now my wife. But imagine if you have a family and kids, imagine trying to do that. So you have 10 minutes a day of phone calls. Yeah. And I had it down to a science. My wife and I would get on and I had a little watch. I had a timer. As soon as she picked up, I would be one minute. So we do one minute, 6 a.m. Like, hey, good morning. I love you. Have a great day. Then we do like two minutes at lunchtime and then we do two minutes in the afternoon, sometimes three minutes. So that's already six minutes. And then the other four minutes, we try to use two or three minutes to say goodnight to each other yeah. and then save a minute for like if there was because there's always a, you're always going to go over. Yeah. And so like the first month, I even had like seven days where I didn't speak to her because I we went over our minutes. Right. So so that's your communication. So you really can't talk about anything. You don't talk about anything over text message. So if she tells me something like, oh, hey, <coughs> I got this new gig because my wife's an actress. I got this new gig doing a commercial for this. Okay. I'm like, oh, babe, I'm so proud of you. That sounds amazing. I love you. Write it all in the email. Like, don't tell me now because let's not waste it. Let's just hear each other's voices. So kind of, then you have- so It sounds like you prioritize, like, so what kind of communication do you prioritize in that environment? It's mostly- Sounds like you. So I I spent almost ninety nine point nine percent of the phone calls was with, with was with my fiance. Uh -huh. A little bit I would do like on birthdays, and you know, I don't really have a good relationship with my parents, so I didn't really speak to them. They, my parents kind of like um, didn't want didn't have didn't have much to do with me during that time. They still don't. Um, so so I just had I was able to free up all the minutes for her, and that was really great. Um, and then there's the email system. The email system is not really email. It's like literally snail mail, but over the computer. So when you write an email to someone, it's already, it's, it's no internet. It's like preset. You have to input the, the email addresses of the people you want to email and they can't email you first. You have to email them first and they have to download a special app on their computer or their phone. It doesn't work half the time. And then there's like a 12 hour delay or like a six hour delay. So you can really only have like a two way conversation with someone every day, at least one time. So that's not really good. And also but you can't really do context in an email because you can't put smileys, gifs, you can't put pictures, you can't do any of that stuff. So it's just text on a screen. But it's good for more longer form content. But then you have the snail mail. Uh -huh. And the beauty about the snail mail is you can draw collages, you can write letters, you can send books, you can colors, you can put even put perfume on a letter. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. you, can, you can really convey your message over the snail mail. 
So I look forward to mail call every day. And it was really great because the crypto community was so awesome about it. Like I would get, dude, people wrote their white papers by hand and fucking mailed it to me. One guy wrote his whole poetry book and mailed it to me. And he's like, I want to publish this poetry book, but no one it wants to proofread it for me. And I know you have nothing else to do. <laughs> so here's like 80 pages of my poetry. Can you please read it and send it back to me? And you're like, you know, I did it. I did wow, it. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I did it because it was awesome. So when I got your package, I remember I got your package and people in jail were always asking me about crypto. <sighs> and um, it's kind of hard to, to go through it. And there's always looking for new information. So it was great about your stuff is that I gave it out to everyone. Oh, yeah. So when I read all of it, <laughs> what? I said, that's great. Yeah, I didn't think about it. Yeah, when I read it, I gave it out to everyone. So at any given time, you see this like, you know, like <laughs> this state senator sitting around reading CoinDesk articles in the in the prison library. <laughs> you know, yeah. you had like, oh, you had, oh, I had like the Bernie Madoff guys reading your stuff. Oh, really? Jeez. Yeah, dude, it was it was really crazy. <laughs> well, I guess that's pretty, you know, like, it's the power of print, right? <laughs> low level drug dealers reading your reading your articles. Oh, geez. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the crazy thing about you know going back to like the writing stuff, right? It's like it's just you know the thing I always liked about crypto is like my when my writing just like showed up in like random places, right? I I, I still remember like being at first consensus <laughs> and like I was talking to this like, random guy. I think he ran like an African like ISP or something like that. And, like we had written something about him doing something with Bitcoin, and then he like pulled up this letter, which was basically like, an email with him and the country's regulator like you know uh with a link to like one of our articles being like what the hell is bitcoin <laughs> and he's like you know don't ever think that what you're doing like doesn't matter and i think like that was what was always cool about it right you know that's you remember that stuff don't you yeah it really sticks with you i think and like you know especially because we're in like a down period in crypto now and it's like you know it's tough right you know i i, I think like i've been really you know when you were saying about like you know people, people feeling excited about the blockchain industry of late um you know i create you know the matrix thing where you know red pill or blue pill it's like i increasingly feel like the guy who's like eating the steak right and he's like you know he's like i just want you to plug me back in <laughs> he's like, you know, like make me an actor just take me you back something yeah. important <laughs> you know <laughs> like like you know because the you know why oh why did i not take the blue pill <laughs> right? you know I, well you're in the crypto space you're a somebody and there's like relevance and everything but then when you when you're out of the crypto you're just walking on the street it's like who are we yeah. No one really cares well, about that, like, that's stuff. the meme. That's like the Matrix meme. I want to like restart. It's like I want to like put me back in, <laughs> like because it's like put me back because you know, it's the important part of well, you know, crypto is like, uh, and this sort of gets back to like the boom and bust nature of it, right? So like, you know, it does seem like we're moving up into the right, but it's in these like very parabolic like up and downs, right? And it's like very easy. It's very, I, I don't know. I, I feel like bull markets are so short. They're like three months or two months. You know, the epic bull markets. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like they they carry for a while, <laughs> and then like you know, but you have these big downs, right? And it's like really hard to like know what to do with yourself sometimes during these down periods, like especially being in like a business. So like curl up and cry. Well, I've been at Coin as five years, and like you know, it's like the down periods. It's like. You know, because like I remember the top of set 2017 like, when we finally got to a thousand again, and it's like you know every once in a while you get these things in crypto where you're like, wow, this plane's like really gonna fucking take off, like this, like this is gonna happen. And then always it that was a big deal, like lurches back. You know what I mean? It's like you know I kind of like refer to these as like the liftoff moments, right? It's like you're sort of like sitting on a plane for like a really long time, and then you, you just get that feeling. You're like, oh, like maybe this is the time, and then like. You know, at the top of 2019, it's like, you know, you get that sinking feeling again. You're like, oh. Holding crypto is very stressful. Um, during the bear markets, when I held little amounts of crypto, I'm like, I feel good. You know, it doesn't, if it goes up or down, like it doesn't really matter. I'm not holding much. But then like I buy back in and price is going up and I'm happy. But then like there's even like $100 that goes down. I'm stressed out. I'm like, I'm just sell it all and go away. I'm tired. <laughs> You lose sleep over it. I, I don't find it like so. I so my personal thing. So I do own cryptocurrency. It's like I, you know, I, I've badly traded over the years, like especially during the first like 2013 like bull market when I wasn't really like doing as much writing. But you know, I failed miserably at being an investor then. It's like now the thing that I've kind of gotten to is I just you know my thing is just you know average in, don't think about it, and then just you know someday later like it'll be fine. Like I I, I don't know. I've, I've I've found out the I've found a mental model that works for me, which is just like. You know, put some money aside, just like don't even think about it and like don't even like like bar yourself from even doing it. You know, it's like uh, just yeah, as, as far as mentally removed from like trying to make money off of this as I can, <laughs> you know, because I think. Do you see yourself like ever leaving the crypto space? 
Oh, that's a tough one, man. I think um, it's hard. I think it's, well, I get asked that question all the time. I think it's hard. You know, so I think with CoinDesk specifically, right? So, you know, CoinDesk is obviously something I put, put a lot of uh, personal time in, right? So it's like I was one of the, you know, member of the founding team. We went up to like 14 people. We went down to two people. Like, you know, one of the things that people don't. When? Yeah. Like one of the things that people don't know about is that like, you know, before we uh, sold the company to DCG is like, we had effectively run out of money. Like, I mean, we had, like, I remember being with my CEO and like, we had some Bitcoin on the balance sheet and we sold like 300 Bitcoin at like $230. Like the next day it was like 300 bucks. But you know, it's like, we, you know, the, the, you know, so the thing that they don't tell you about launching like a major event, like consensus. And the first one was a success is that like, you know, you immediately need another million plus bucks to turn around and do another event. Right. So we had a successful event with consensus. We had saved the brand, but we, we just didn't have the capital for another event. Right. So, and there was no willingness like Shaq, our original owner, he'd sort of like tuned out. He like didn't care anymore. He thought Bitcoin was going away or whatever. So he, he was out. And, you know, there was only a few people we'd go to at the time. It was like Uncle Adam, Uncle Barry. What, Uncle what made you so die hard then? What made you so die hard to like stick with I don't it? think like, I had anywhere I mean, else to go. I don't think I had anywhere else to go. And I, I keep going back to that. And it's like, you know, well, and I, I don't think I had anywhere else to go. And I and I just also thought I saw the opportunity in it, right? It's like, I again, because of these moments that we're talking about, right? Where you're saying like, you know, you and President. This is a pivotal moment. Well, like, Try to put, put us in the frame of mind that you were in at that moment. <laughs> well, so we were getting a lot. So it was like me and Stan Higgins, like another longtime Coinus guy. And, you know. Was Ryan Selkis involved at this point or not yet? Not yet. So like, that's where I okay. sort of got back in. I actually, I, I traveled to the Virgin Islands. Like I was, I sort of like rented a house there for a while. I sort of British felt... or American? Uh, American. Uh, so I was actually on, okay. um, uh, what's the big one? Uh, I can't remember. Not St. John, St. Thomas. So yeah, I was on St. Thomas. For mm-hmm. a long mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, I need to mellow out. Like I need to figure, figure out what I'm doing. So that's when I got the call from Ryan. He was like, you know, Hey, we're thinking about buying Coindesk. Like if you want to sign on, we're going to do it right. But I need you to come back to New York. And I'm sitting there looking at like the blue ocean, like from my back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, shit, do, do I really want to do this? Again. And like, but look, I always wanted to do Coindesk right. It's like, you know, I never stopped believing that Coindesk was something that mattered and that like someone should do it right. Because like otherwise, you know what that reminds me of? It's like, you ever see those movies where like the spy or like the secret agent finally, you know, yeah, yeah. like James Bond sitting on a beach with his girl. And then like he gets the call from, from um, what's his, the mom, oh, whatever. I am, I think I am, yeah. Yeah. M, and she's like, we need you back. Right, and he's yeah. like. Oh. Just when they, just when you thought you were out, they pull you back in, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's a true story. Da-da, 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 da-da. Yeah, it's a true story. I mean, like, you know, I was, I think it was tough. And like, you know, we decided to do it again because we believed in like the Coindesk brand. There was like a few other buyers like around who were like kind of jockeying. I think we eventually settled on DCG because like, you know, Ryan had that vision. And then, you know, he, you know, his motto. Was, what was the vision? Well, I think the vision for, well, Man, the vision was, uh, I guess what it always is for CoinDesk, right? Like the idea was to kind of unite data, uh, journalism and events, like in a single kind of vehicle, right? Um, and I don't think CoinDesk has ever like put those three things together. I think we've at times had like at best two of those things. Um, we've sort of always kind of like struggled for like the complete thing. But eventually like, you know, you, um, hmm, what is that thing? I think like, you know, I, when I try to describe Coindesk, it's I think like, you know, it's what the people kind of who aren't in the crypto industry uh, look at to see what's going on. And we have the responsibility to kind of like properly project like what is going on for the people below. So we're kind of like this weird lens. Um, you know, I know people call it like the proof of record or the paper of record, right? It's like some how people refer to us sometimes is basically like, you know, if it matters, it's on Coindesk and we kind of like serve as this weird sort of like, you know, validator of like the history of the industry. And I think... Um, you know, really, well, so you know. it, from an outsider, the where CoinDesk fits in is that like, and I when I when I don't mean under you, what I mean by that is you have, you have all the press, you have all the media under CoinDesk that kind of like looks up to CoinDesk, yeah. whereas they all want to get quoted by mainstream media because when mainstream media quotes you, then you get um, a lot more hits, mm, but sure. and you can sell more advertising. But CoinDesk is really the only one that mainstream media quotes. Right. So you're kind of like the in between. Right, yeah, yeah. You're one foot in mainstream media. You're one foot in crypto media. Yeah, I think it's a good way to describe it. I mean, I, good place yeah. to be, though, right? Sure, it's like a responsibility, right? You know, our, uh, you know, but I think like you know, 
for the audience size that we have, I mean, we have some of the toughest, toughest critics like the over fine, right? You know, so I think <laughs> one of the things. But that means people are reading it, yeah, though, yeah, if you I have agree. critics. That's I a agree. Good thing. I agree. Look, I, I don't. And one of the things that gets me is like, you know, it's like I, I've, you know, I've never been a person who like got, have gone out and pl- complained about these things. I, I would actually even mind when people like, you know, complain about Coindesk. I think that's fine. It's like a healthy thing, right? I, I sort of like view Coindesk as one of those things. It's like Batman, right? It's like, you know, it's this weird abstract symbol where it's like, you know, I like people who like troll Coindesk. I think that's like a fine activity, right? Because they're doing it to like put out a point, right? So like money trigs or like those guys like sort of- And even if they don't intend to, it makes you better. Yeah, sure. And they're, they're like putting their point out, right? So it's like, I think people use Coindesk like as a vehicle for criticism. Like I, I responded to some tweet the other day about this Ethereum guy and he was like, oh, like it's finally, Coindesk is finally mentioning the Ethereum blockchain like in headlines. And I was like, I don't know, for <laughs> years, like the banks weren't saying what blockchain they were using. It's impossible to like, you know, I can't print like assumptions, but you know, when you become like a bellwether of those kind of things, it's like, you know, I, I think criticism of Coin. I've never been angry about criticism of CoinDesk. I've always tried to be like pretty respectful of it. I've always been trying to be mindful of this thing that I put a lot of personal time into, like you know, resurrecting from this point where it was like basically dead, uh, into you know, basically like understanding that people want to use CoinDesk as a vehicle for criticism, and that's fine. I think where it's gotten kind of weird lately is that you know the industry is in this sort of down period where sort of like tearing everything apart, and. You know, you look at the companies that are getting a lot of shit. It's like Coindesk or Coin Market Cap or like all these other things, and it's like, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, or like Coinbase, like gets a lot of shit these days, which is like, you know, for a company that never lost anyone. Coinbase money. does get a lot of shit these days. Yeah, but you know what about Coinbase? They never fucking lost anybody's money. So you know, it's true. <laughs> like, they like, serve. You know, as you much know. as I criticize Coinbase, they sure. serve the industry. Sure. They never lost anybody's money. And at the end of the day, say what you will about Coinbase. They could have done that. They could have fucked up a lot worse. And they, you know, like they're, but again, like, so that we have these sort of like legacy brands in crypto. And I think there's such a bias for like new things in crypto. And this is something that I felt personally like kind of weird about lately. It's like, I don't think it's just in crypto. I think it's in the world at large. I think yeah. even look at our president and stuff like that. We want more new things. Like I saw like Joe Biden's running for president okay. and I don't care either way. Everyone's like, oh, well, you know, like what kind of, uh, what kind of world do we live in where we can't even find a president that was uh, from this decade because we want new things. And I'm like, but who cares? Like yeah. if you'd be a good president, what does it matter? But there's such an overwhelming bias to that. Right. So it's like, um, you know, the, if you look at the people who like, you know, Binance is like kind of universally praised, but like Coinbase is like universally bashed and it falls into this like weird dichotomy where it's like, this doesn't like rationally like assess the value of these things. It's just sort of this weird, um, you know, there's this weird lens where it's like, you know, it's like, is coin market cap, bad it's like yeah sure it's not the perfect data source but like what are they not good enough well but it's like what else were they gonna be they grew so fast it was a one-man team you know and and like they still provided something of value right it's like the thing about coin market cap is that they were they provided the single thing that you could look at to understand the state of the industry it was immensely valuable it was they had immense foresight because they started building it still is yeah it still is and they, they, they started building it long before people thought it would be valuable. You know, they started building it when people were still like, Bitcoin is going to be the only blockchain. They, they took a very bold directional strategy that paid off very well for them. And look, they have some things to fix. But I think, you know, what I've seen that really bothers me on social media these days is just sort of like this, this like willingness to like take a hammer at these like things that exist. And it's like, oh, okay, you're not even going to give these people an opportunity to fix it or whatever. It's like, you know, scaling Coindesk has been one of the hardest things that I've ever tried to approach because, you know, and, and so here's here's just like a figure of reference for you that's like kind of interesting. So when we were a four man team, uh, it was McMe, Stan, myself, Michael, who's now at Forbes, and Alyssa, who's still with us, uh, in 2017, that team was like 75% as productive as the team we have now. That's like almost 15 people. And like, that's crazy. That's a crazy number. And like, you, and you think about like why that is, it's like, well, you know, smaller. Everyone wore many hats. Yeah, smaller teams are just like you know they they're more efficient. Like they know more. We're all really plugged in. We like had a really consistent vision. It's really easy to manage when you get to the point where it's like fifteen people and you're building. You know, other. You know, you kind of go from this like no huddle offense to this like huddle offense. It's like dramatically different. Like, so- Dude, it's the roller coaster tycoon effect. That's what it is. So I, I and I need I need someone. Dude, I need someone to make a Wikipedia entry and yeah. give me credit because I talk about this all the time. Yeah. The roller coaster tycoon effect. And what that is, is when I used to, I was a kid I, and I, I used to play game all the time. So but... you know exactly what I'm talking about. when a roller coaster would break. If you sent one mechanic, it would take 10 minutes to get fixed. If you sent <laughs> two mechanics, it would take five minutes to get fixed. 
But if you sent three mechanics, it would take 15 minutes to get fixed. Huh. Because when you have, it's it's the law of diminishing returns. Right. When you have too many people, it it everyone's spread out. There's no one job. So that that roller coaster tycoon taught me a very valuable well, I, lesson. I think it's the thing. It's like you're trying to systematize something, right? So like one of the things I'm trying to do with CoinS now is like you know you have to break down. You have to go from this like high production team, and then you have to go like okay, well, what are all these things that the people are doing? You end up breaking it down to all these like processes and things, and like ultimately you hope that that other system you know, will become exponential because what eventually we'll be able to do is sort of like spin up a new, like, you know, the next pro run, we can spin up a office somewhere and they can just use this kind of out of the box tools and then kind of like spin up a coin desk, right? So you kind of get, you, you want to get to the point where like, say something like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, right? They're so, they're institutions that are so abstract that like anyone can join. They have this sort of like, you know, not to kind of like, I, again, highfalutin with this decentralized thing, but like, you know, things that are decentralized, they have lower barriers to entry. You can kind of like come in and you can like do your thing within the context of the thing. And a lot of the work that we're doing in Coindesk now, it's sort of like, you know, we're not a small high production team that is competing for venture capital. We're a business that is earning money and that is growing year over year, but that we're also trying to like systematize something for the opportunity that we see that's larger, which is that, you know, this is a 24 hour market. It's the technologies around the globe and we want to be the global information resource, right? Um, so if you're going to be global, it's like, well, if I can write down all the cryptocurrency reporters, and this was one of my early thought processes with Binance, so I was like, well, how the hell am I going to scale this thing? Because I can write anybody who writes about it on a single piece of white paper. Well, it's like the answer is you have to like grow your own people. You have to train them over time. You have to develop a framework for them to be successful. And you get all these things. But, you know, back to what you're talking about with the companies, it's like, I, I, I find that it's it's so easy to like kind of praise these like early companies that seem so exciting or it's like lightning startups. Oh, they're so exciting. Or it, like, you know, it's like the attention that is paid to lightning today versus BitPay. It's like BitPay is probably a better business now than they've ever been. They're probably making more money now. They're probably more efficient. No one talks about, no one about BitPay. And in fact, Tony Gallippi, like love the guy. I've known him for forever. Steven Pear too. Tony Gallippi lives like an hour away from me. Mm. We have lunch very often, very frequently. Um, his family is a beautiful family and, but he won't come on the show hmm. because, and I'm actually mad at him a little bit. Like Tony, if you're listening, I want you to come on the show, but I understand. I respect it because you know what? He's not a target. He's under the radar. The company's chugging away. Wow. It's making money. It's wow. doing its thing. And, and as much as Roger Veer was out there, um, getting companies to accept Bitcoin, BitPay was doing it more. Right. Well, I mean, like, so th this is a classic case, right? So it's like the hive mind of crypto Twitter. It's sort of like, it, you know, it's like this weird eye of Sauron that like directs its attention at like very random things. And it's like, you know, the thing that I've come to like kind of dislike about it is it's just, it's, you know, uh, it's very, um, there's no like independent thought, like, or there is, but like, you know, they, 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 we fall into groupthink like so easily. Like, you know, I look at like the things like with the Anthony Pompliano or Dan Held. And look, I love Dan. I'm like really glad that like people really care about what Dan's saying now. I'm not like trying to diminish <laughs> him, but I'm just saying it's like, you know, there's a sort of like this Hallmark card like quality to like some of the things um, you know, that are happening. If you were to define 2018 in one, in, in, in two words, I think the answer would be crypto Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's fallen off substantially from where it was. I mean, there, there's no question. It got like, really bad. Yeah. Well, I just mean in total, total use. I mean, I'm sure crypto Twitter, like if you were to like quantify it somehow, is like the participation is like very down. But also like the the whole um, uh, USF, was it U, 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 Yeah, it was USF, UASF. right? The whole UASF thing happened over crypto Twitter. And then the whole Segwit2x thing happened over crypto Twitter. So crypto Twitter, I mean, the same thing with like the president election, you can um really control things by incorrect messaging and troll farms uh this was less of a comment for me about governance i think crypto governance is like one of those things that i like have a lot of like weird person like i just like not a thing that i like i, I think with the, to me the bitcoin forks like what do you think about crypto governance because i think that crypto governance shouldn't exist at all yeah i mean i agree i think the lesson from the scaling debates was that we nobody wants governance that that's i think yes. yeah. <laughs> i think that's the overwhelming answer. any token or coin that tries to yeah, create so their dumb. own governance so model dumb. yeah so dumb it's it doesn't work i was saying the best thing. governance yeah. is nothing it's but i nothing. think yeah but i think what what those forks and the segwit 2x and 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 i was in the right messaging aspect of it, I was originally part of that yeah, that, remember, yeah. that crowd that wanted to essentially, we were like trying to be peacemakers essentially, oh. but um, but originally what what um, what we've learned is that the best thing that Bitcoin has going for it is its unwillingness to change. 
Yeah, I would kind of paraphrase it as like, um, you know, like the Joker in the Dark Knight where he says, you know, the thing about chaos is it's fair. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like as soon as you move away from a chaotic system. I love that quote. It, uh, where is that quote from? Uh, it's from the Dark Knight where he's like sitting there with uh, Two-Face and he's uh, Two-Face is in the hospital chair and, you know, he slaps the coin in his hands. He's got the gun to his head and he's like, you know, you can kill me if you want. I killed your little girlfriend. You know, it wasn't personal. And then he's like, you know, at the end, he says, like, you know, the thing about chaos is it's fair. And then that's when the that's when Two Face decides to go bad, or you know, turns away from Batman. That's unbelievable quote, and it really is so perfect. No, it's great. Well, I, mean, I was thinking about it like earlier, like this week. It's like you know, once you try, you know, it's like the Joker's like the schemers, you know. So the schemers are their little plans. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Do you? You're obviously very passionate about CoinDesk because. Yeah. It's your baby. So you've been with it during well, I, hard I, I times and good times. Baby so much as like, I feel like it's like this weird thing that I got like adopted. It's like a dog that I liked adopted. Like, okay. So it's your adopted baby. <laughs> well, cause like, you know, I, I wasn't really the founder. Like I, I, I sort of like helped in the rebooting, but I've never been like. The founders are not defined by time. Like, yeah. like um, P- Peter Smith is founder of the blockchain.info, but it was founded four years before he was even involved. Well, I mean, there's the word founder and like, you know, a lot of people are quote unquote founders of a lot of things in crypto that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like spiritually, I guess like, I, you know, I provided a lot of like intellectual thought, like to CoinDesk and I think I've helped it along. And I think, um, you know, if you want to that, like, chief visionary you know, officer, I was, yeah, <laughs> something like, like that. Silicon yeah. Valley. That's what I call myself. I took it from Silicon Valley <laughs> for crypto IQ. I say I'm yeah. the chief visionary officer. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't even like having the editor in chief title for a while. I think it's kind of dumb. I just called myself the editor. I, I, I don't know. I just think like people get really easily drawn into like. I don't know. Like, again, the space, like, it's like, you know, uh, like, do I believe cryptocurrencies are going to be impactful and they're going to change the world? Yes. But like in saying that, do I feel stupid? Like, yes. So like, there's like a half, there's like a happy medium here. It's like, you know, you kind of like, I don't know. It's it's sort of like, um, it's like, I think maybe Andreas said said something about this, uh, or he had a quote about ICOs, right? Where he's like 99% of ICOs are scams. But I see the the technology that enables ICOs will change capital distribution. And we have to live in a world where these two things are true. And I think that's what's so hard about being crypto is you sort of have to live in like the current state in which like most of it is complete garbage and then know that in the future that won't be true. That's what a free market is. A free market doesn't always work in your favor. Markets are efficient, but we have to allow them to be. And they have to learn from their own, from the market has to learn from its own mistakes. And, but it has to make those mistakes. And the whole point of being in a free market is we don't have a centralized party telling us this is a mistake that you're about to make, or we think it's a mistake. And a lot of libertarians actually say, like, and this is their argument, is what gave the government the right to prevent me from making my own mistakes. And I understand, I kind of empathize with that a little bit because I understand that. we oh. It's like I used to tell my parents, like, let me make my own mistakes because if I don't make those mistakes, then I'm not going to learn from them. Right. So the crypto industry has mistakes. We've had scams, we've had fails, but without Mt. Gox failing, we may not have had decentralized exchanges. You know, right. so you, it's just, you need them in a way, don't you? Yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely hugely agree with that. I think we've been bad in the crypto industry about praising our failures because I think, you know, that's what you're saying. It's like, I think I tweeted about this recently and like, I said, every, what is a shit coin but a market thesis that's dis- disproven? And it's like, you know, uh, and I have a hard time with Bitcoin maximalism. Uh, maximalism. Oh, that's a very good point. You know, say that again. Uh, what is a shit? What is a shit coin but a market market thesis waiting to be disproven? Because <laughs> that's what it is, though. Right, it's an experiment. Yeah. Right, but if yeah. people are using it, then how could it be a failed experiment? Yes, right. agreed. Like, and that's, oh. and that's the thing. It's like so, but we don't. And so this is my like problem with like Bitcoin maximalism a bit. And like again, so let me just preface this by saying like over time I have I have gained an immense personal appreciation for the Bitcoin network. I think the Bitcoin network is one of the wonders of the world. It's a beautiful thing. It is a it is a miraculous miracle that we still continue to like understand as much as we do about it. But like I have a problem with Bitcoin maximalism because it adopts this like anti-human like standpoint in which like it assumes that like human beings will like never be able to do anything better than that or even anything that's like tangentially valuable. And it's like I have a problem with Bitcoin maximalism is it's just like it's it's inherent like pessimism about humans. Like it's just kind of dumb. It's selfish. Uh, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I, it it's 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 dumb and that it just doesn't believe it's like if you say that you're a bitcoin maximalist it's almost like you're saying you don't believe in humans like it's you- like saying uh, uh, to the same extent it's like saying aliens don't exist 
Even though we don't have proof that aliens don't exist, I feel like it's selfish to say that there isn't life somewhere. Yeah. I think, like, well, and, like, I think, like, you know, the Ethereum thing, it's, like, you know, obviously it's, like, I've become less of, like, a blockchain liberal, like, over time, but, like, I still, I, I still like the spirit of it, like, it's, like, I still try to, like, remind myself of the spirit of it, so, like, to what you're saying about crypto governance, it's, like, I, I think a lot of that stuff is silly and useless, but, you know, Coindesk, like, as an institution, like, has to report on it, because it's a viable market thesis that's proven until disproven, and the thing that, you know, the thing that is so We're all capitalists at the end of the day. 100% true, but the thing, we all want to make money. the thing that if you look back on, you look back on what people, the VCs, the smart people, like you yourself, or like people in the industry, what people bet on, and I'll give you two really strong examples that I think a lot about, is nobody wanted fuck all to do with ICOs. People who were doing that stuff in 2014 were pariahs. Like, you could not interview them, you could not talk about them. Stable coins were the other ones, like nobody. Wait, really? Can you give me an example? Oh, actually, it was like, um, like I'll give you. Well, so I was talking like David Johnston or like Michael Turpin. Oh yeah, David Johnston was labeled a scammer. Was a pariah. For, oh yeah, you he he was literally labeled a scammer in so many circles, but now he's laughing at all of us because he now right. he's the godfather of that. He's right. a great guy too. He was right. And the thing is, we were so bad to people who made counter directional bets, and we're still doing that right now. Crypto is still being so terrible to people who are making counter-directional bets because we don't have an appreciation. We haven't learned to, you know, love our failures. And I think that's, it's, it, look, I agree it's a fine line because, like, look, you have BitConnect, like, it's scammed a ton of people. One coin scammed a ton of people. But, like, you know, I'll give you another example. Tron, like, love it or hate it, it's a legitimate market thesis until it's proven that it's useless. It is is something that somebody released. I don't know if it's good. I don't know if it's bad whatever it's out there and it's it it, ha, it has the opportunity to prove or disprove its thesis whatever that may be and the thesis there's so many good examples of that iota uh, um um what's the other one tezos i get yeah, tezos, yeah. people are shilling tezos to me all day on my twitter <laughs> but they've been shilling it to me when it was at 30 cents and all the way up and now it's at a dollar 50 <laughs> So well, I'm like so the right is so the, and then you go back and you're like okay well who were the investors that really made it it was like it was the people who like you know like I, I go back and I was talking about this with some VC uh, venture capitalist the other day I can't remember who it was um but I was saying like you know if you look back at the early investors who was consistently right and the answer is Brock fucking Pierce like the answer is Brock that, Pierce the answer yeah. was that Brock Pierce was right about it everything and it wasn't because he was like took this like highfalutin i'm super smart guy he just invested in everything he just chose to believe and like this and look i've met brock i had a lot of problems with like yeah he's known to the, he's known about the guy in the industry that if you have even a basic business idea he'll give you 50 or 100 grand and you know, he'll take one percent of every company right and i think he was there <laughs> so there's it's a tough thing because I think like, and I don't want to like speak uh, negatively about anybody too much, but like, I think like Brock, it's like, it's like you either look at Brock and you can choose to believe, okay, this is a guy who like genuinely believes in humans, like funds all these things. Bad way to look at it is like, okay, well maybe he just like doesn't care and he just like kind of sprays and prays all his money like everywhere. But you know, at some point, it's like, at what point do you go back and look at the history and been like, okay, first ICO, uh, Brock was there. Uh, first stablecoin, Brock was there. Uh, first STO, Brock was there. And you're like, look at his, the resume and it's like, okay, well, you know, every, he did everything. <laughs> it's like so i don't know it, it, it's but why what what makes brock different what makes brock different is just he was yeah. he just found himself he was always in like kind of the opportunity of doing something first that like proved to be genuinely innovative but i think that was just because he did every he didn't say he didn't say no to things or he he didn't like unthink things or come up to strategies that were um you know, so like DCG, like adopted this strategy where they were like, oh, Bitcoin economics is economically sound and we're not going to invest in Ethereum because it's not economically sound. And that was like a really bizarre, stupid thing to do. And like they missed out on Ethereum. And, but they had the thesis. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know. So what about uh, crypto Twitter? Uh, just very, you know, very briefly with crypto Twitter, I feel like um, people who are very passionate kind of get start to duke it out on crypto twitter and yeah. then they um and i've i'm so guilty of this and yeah, i've been guilty of it lately <laughs> oh yeah i read something about that um yeah with the block what what's yeah. going on there people who are, who are in the position of providing market clarity should be very careful about what they say and they shouldn't say things that are untrue like I, I think so. So over the years, like I have not spoken out against many people and I have held my tongue at a lot of times where like I have been personally attacked. And I think like where the line for me on this is and why I really don't like what's going on there. When and, they lie. And, and I've said some shitty things as well, but it's like I, I just think that like 
to be competitive with somebody is one thing. And then it's like to, to, to like, so like just like adopt a stance where you just like so blatantly hate this other thing for no other reason other than to like perpetuate your business model it's just like it's really it's really shitty it's it's that's how trump became president though yeah and agreed you know it's like um you know here's an example it's like so with bitcoin magazine or like coin telegraph or like you know uh bitcoin.com it's like i know all those guys like we were competitive like we used to kind of like fuck with each other and like when we saw each other we used to kind of like you know there was a competitive spirit there but it was never like I didn't go out on Twitter and like call out somebody as being like, Oh, this article was shit. Like this guy's an asshole, like whatever. It's like, I didn't like that wasn't done. And it's like, and I think part of it's like the hubris, right? It's like, you know, I I never thought crypto journalism was like so important that like, you know, it, it needs to always be right. Or like, you need to like constantly be calling out these people. It's like, it turns into like, it's like the constant need to always being right. Like turns into like this form of bullying. And it's just like, um, I don't know. It's just like it's it's it, it's so beneath and just like it's, it's like an objective. I read that it, it had something to do with like <laughs> you guys asking for exclusivity, but I'll tell you this: I'm gonna be on a on a on a on um. I did um. I can't even tell you which one it is, but I'm gonna. I got interviewed for a very mainstream media TV show, uh, new show. It's gonna be on in May, and they asked me and I had to sign something basically saying that I won't do any other mainstream media until that airs. So it's extremely common in the industry. Well, that's so what why I'm is that such a like, piece of well, contention? And, well, so it's not because the person <laughs> no. who's saying the claim doesn't understand. So it's like, he doesn't have the background of understanding media. So he's just like, Oh, these people are doing this like really shady thing. And it's like, no, I mean like <laughs> I'm a media outlet. It's like, I want to have exclusive information. That's I'm overwhelmingly biased towards that because I want my readers to have a good experience. And that's like, oh, how all media outlets are. Um, but like, that's just, a, that's just how they work. That's how they operate. So it's like, it's not that like, we, but again, it was the self-importance. It was like, Oh, like they're doing this against but us. Like, you, you said something very important earlier and that is, you know, the pie, right? So, yeah. and a lot of my guests have talked about this, that the, the, they get a little burnt out because, and you were around back then in those, even three, four, five years ago, it was very much like an us versus the world mentality. Yeah. So even your competition you, you were competing, very strongly competing, but you didn't attack each other because you all decided that, hey, let's build this pie together and then fight over it later on instead of fighting over the small crumbs yeah, that yeah, we have like now. Too, I think it's too early in crypto for us to like have these things that are like antithesis. So like, you know, it's like as much as I love Masari, it's like I love Ryan. I love his vision for that product. Like, you know, do I think we need to have a better coin market cap or should coin market cap just be better? I like, I don't, we have all these alternatives to things that themselves are alternatives. <laughs> and it's like, what is the value in a market for an alternative alternative? <laughs> well, it's like, it's such a small it's people small. want the first alternative anyway, then like, why do you want the second alternative? And it's like, uh, it's just so confusing. It's like crypto is, but that's the thing where it's like, you know, uh, and so as an entrepreneur, I feel like, you know, you, sh- you will probably appreciate this, but I think, um, what we've really seen in crypto over the last few years is that the Silicon Valley model of valuing startups is, is has been totally broken by crypto. There, there, there's there's no way to do it. Like you, because acquiring users, like the Silicon Valley basically is acquire users and eventually monetize those users and then IPO. That that model will be done by a few crypto companies, but it's so antithetical to like what is going to happen here because it's just like you you can't you uh, it's like in many cases you can't do it or just the cyclical nature of like the boom and bust of like the user cycles. It's just too fast. It's like, you know, you, you like, as you were saying, it's like the opportunity to grow a company in 2017 was three months and it happened like that. Um, you know, something I wrote recently is sort of like crypto has two seasons, like drought and monsoon. And that's it. It's like when it rains, it rains and you gotta be ready for the rain. But then otherwise you're just living through the drought. And I don't think, uh... know, I don't think we know how to build companies like in that environment. I think that's like, and I mean, we, I mean like, you know, it's everybody in crypto. We don't, we just don't know how to build companies for that. Are you familiar with the Bible? <laughs> like as a, as a book? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up very uh, religious and, uh, and there's a, there's a, there's a biblical story of are Joseph. You familiar with the most famous book of all time, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and the most published. Yeah. <laughs> there's a story of Joseph and Joseph basically, uh, um, uh, Egypt was going through like an amazing uh, period of, of growth. Mm. And Joseph had a dream and Joseph's dream was that 
Egypt is about to go through like a seven year drought or something like that. Uh And so Joseph woke up from the dream and went to the Pharaoh and told him, hey, Pharaoh, you need to build all these stores of grain, all these silos, because you're going to have a seven year uh, drought. And no one believed him, but Pharaoh believed him and Pharaoh did it. And then the drought came and all the countries around around Egypt where, 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 where people were dying because they had no food. They didn't save for the future, but everyone was coming to Egypt because Egypt had saved for survival. And I tell that story. I do a little bit of angel investing and I tell that story to, to, to the CEOs that potentially come to me and say, how are you going to prepare for the drought? Because crypto drought is coming, even right. though it's a bull market right now. How are you going to prepare? How are you going to survive? Mm-hmm. Yeah, agreed. But I, I think like so that thesis also I've begun to think is problematic specifically because uh, there's ways to I, I think like if you look at what will happen is someday we'll understand this really well. We'll be able to say crypto entrepreneurship is sort of you take the curve of the network and there's like sort of a boom period and a bust period. And like on one hand, you have the ability to acquire new users. And on the other hand, you have the ability to serve power user products. And I think there is there is a way, and I think that's what is so cool about what Binance is doing is they're actually they've actually done this curve very well. They they they, they uh, injected a lot of capital in the company when it was possible to expand massively and quickly acquire users. And now with like Launchpad and like sort of all the Binance Coin and these other things, it's like now they're serving power user products. So that's like I disagree with that like drought thing. It's a little bit because it's sort of like. You know, what I've seen within Coindesk and elsewhere is like you get this like sort of like ideology where it's like, oh, blame it on the weather. Oh, it's right. It's not sunny today. So we can't do business, which also like isn't really that like you don't want companies that just like sit around on both the bullets of cash for like a while. It doesn't help anybody. So, you know, how do you like how do you actually like do the curve right? It's like, well, you need to be active like along it, but like in different ways. Does that make sense? It does. But how? As like I, during this, I don't think we know, but I think that's fine because I think that the two models, like you, you build, yeah, you can just know that one model is not that great, and you can just say like, okay, well, if you massively acquire users and then just like sit on that capital, well, it's like you're not increasing the quality of the user experience such that when the next bubble happens, like that you can just kind of like quickly kind of launch a bunch of other things. So I don't know. I think that. Um, I have a problem with this sort of like complacency, sort of like cash in the couch, sort of like entrepreneur vibe, because I I do think we need to like sort of uh, if crypto is going to be a seasonal business, then like we need to think about building like year round businesses. Like essentially we're like Cape Cod, like people come to us for three months. It's like where I live in Florida. Yeah. Our population doubles between October and May. Right. And so like year round businesses and those those environments have different characteristics than seasonal businesses. And I think crypto sort of like praises the seasonal business and like we don't have enough year round businesses. That's a very that's a very good that's a very good topic I want to discuss now and maybe in the future, too. But the seasonal versus seasonal crypto businesses versus year round businesses. That's very interesting. Can you give me some ideas of some good like year round businesses? Um, or types well, or types, you don't have to name them directly, but types. Well, no, no, this is great. Cause this is something I've been thinking about a lot. So the crypto lenders are a crypto winter business, which is very interesting. They're there. That's probably the only class of startups that seems alt lending, Nexo, salt, all these. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, well, so they're not seasonal. They're actually a seasonal. So they actually sell the most in markets where that, that are, that's not in season. I would, I would imagine. Speaking of Brock Pierce, he just took a mortgage out with a crypto backed mortgage. Yeah. I'm sure dude, the guy's always in the right place at the right time. Uh, but uh, what was I going to say? So like, I don't, so a seasonal crypto business would be, hmm, Maybe BitPay has become like a, a non-seasonal crypto business. Maybe like a, that's what they've gotten well. Uh, I think Coin Market Cap's like always open. CoinDesk is always open. You know, we're we're sort of like the town diners, right? We're like always. I around. love the town diners. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like we're always around. I I think like um, I don't know. Like I would actually maybe we should think about this, and I would I'd be curious to get your notes on it. I've, it's something I've been really thinking a lot about, which is like. I think we're we're not we're we're not really just thinking enough about this, and we we kind of have two bad strategies, which is sort of like, okay, we know Silicon Valley doesn't work, uh, and then we have sort of like the cash on the couch model, and I don't think the cash on the couch model works as well because it's like, well, how do you know when to start spending the cash? And like, I that's think, the problem. I think the difference is because in all the previous bull and bear markets, no one asked um, like when is the bear market going to be over. They would ask. Right. Right. Is Bitcoin going to actually yeah. exist a right. year from now? Right, a hundred percent, a hundred, a thousand percent agree with that. And I think, but we know now, and I we th- do. W- I think what we know now is that the the having is creating cyclical 
a cyclical uh, like economic booms and recessions within its own. It's like the Bitcoin code is like, and this is uh, this is like another beautiful thing like that no one's talking about. It's like the Bitcoin having seems to be programmatically enforcing like a cyclical somewhat four year appreciate or die. Bitcoin has to appreciate, keep not just the price, right. but the industry has to grow every four years or it'll die. Right. But the but programmatically, what we've found is that the having sort of like kicks off this sort of like somebody showed me this thing yesterday. I was trying to like make some content around it, which is like it just mapped out like the four year cycles of like the last two bull markets to bear markets. And it's just like it maps so well. And you're like, oh, my God, is the having actually like a programmatic economic catalyst? <laughs> like and and if true, that's fucking incredible. <laughs> like and then people should be talking about that because it's just it's it, it, that would be incredible. Like if Bitcoin is could ensure its own perpetuation by programmatic become self fulfilling prophecies, yeah, one hundred percent. Because not it's not only awesome to know when the bull market is going to be, but I rather know when the bear market's going to be. Right. right. That's more important to know. If well, anything, you wouldn't well, rather well, know when the you know this is all stuff we're trying to understand, right? And I think like what 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 has sucked about crypto Twitter is, is like it's it's this culture that doesn't doesn't value like sort of it's like it's not contextual though. It's like yeah, in the moment, yeah, right? 140 characters it's like lightning has a billion nodes Dude, like people the, used to make fun of people used to make fun of like twitter and facebook saying yeah. oh i'm not gonna post pictures of my food or post pictures of me sitting on the toilet well, now but to be honest with you that's really like the best case of twitter and facebook anyways <laughs> because anything more than that you're not gonna write your master's thesis on twitter yeah it's it's hard man well i, I just think we're dealing with like um you know, I, I don't know. It's it's where I do think that Twitter has value. I do think that these things are somewhat good. What I what I don't like about it though is that I, what what I feel badly about is I see a lot of people who have, who sort of like, you know, they've provided a lot. These businesses that have provided a lot, and then we sort of are so quick to tear things down, like just for the gratification of like seeming like we're interesting. Like, I think that's, that's kind of the thing that's shitty about it. And I think like Stan, like I work with said it really right. It's sort of like the problem with crypto Twitter is like, it's sort of like the need to be like seen being right all the time. And it's just such, such a perverse culture. It's like, I don't know. I don't need to like, for you to think I'm right all the time. And like, even worse than that, it's like, I don't need you to see me doing that. It's like, I can be right and I can be wrong. And like people, because we're people and that's fine. But like, is you know. we used to value people who did stuff higher right we value you built a company you you did something in the space to further the to further the uh crypto industry you know but now you have these like inf crypto influencers who haven't really done anything but because they write well or they are smarter and they can put people down and have as many followers that's value i guess we value them and we look up to them do you think those people should have value or should they so they I think not... they do have value. So I have a problem with saying that anything doesn't have any value. Um, I just think that it it sucks that there's such a dominant force in the conversation because you know we rely on social media networking like so much to like, communicate with each other. And I think it's just that again, it's not really the the message or the medium. It's like it's just that it's the it's that success in the medium is is measured by gratification. You know, you sort of have this like uh, love like Twitter Facebook uh, kind of thing. It's like you know. Well, I don't know. It's like crypto Twitter. It's, it's like sort of like always like, uh, you know, it's up its own ass like a lot of the time, you know, in terms of like talking about these things or just, um, I don't even know. It's like, I, 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 like, I don't like it. I don't think it's valueless. I don't think it's stupid. I just think that what I'm lamenting a bit is that it, it seems to not, it seems to present like kind of a warped picture of things. And, and I, and I, maybe people do broadly believe that like crypto Twitter is not that useful. And in my own personal conversations, I think a lot of people, you know, I talk to, you know, it's weird because we'll, we'll have this conversation and I'll be like, oh, I'm kind of like, you know, feeling kind of down about crypto Twitter. I'm like, I don't think it like properly values people who are contributing to the space and the person will agree with you, but then we'll both go to Twitter anyway. And we'll just- Dude, on my screen time, I'm on Twitter the most. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because there's so much value in it. But I guess the point of this conversation is to make people recognize that you should always take things with a grain of salt. I think that's my well, point. How many people's entire impressions are like created of things on Twitter? I, I think that's what it is. I don't. I don't think it's really the problem of like people saying it. It's just like that people take the entirety of the thing. It's like, um, you know. So one of the things, like, so lightning is like a great example. It's like the whole, like, you know, like, is the online dialogue about Bitcoin's lightning net, lightning network in any way scientific or interesting or relevant? No, it's just a bunch of people like parroting like, a bunch of random facts about something that they probably know very little about. Um, I just used lightning this morning and I love it. 
Um, yeah, I mean, like uh, the tipping stuff. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about lighting, but I'm just saying like uh, just the dialogue around it. It's very like cartoonish. It's know? all on. I have to be honest with you. Ninety percent of the information that I know about lightning is from Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the yeah, way it is. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I, think... I mean, so tell me about this RV. <laughs> Yeah, I lived in an RV for like a whole year while I was working at Coindesk. What kind of know. RV? Like a good one or like, like a VW bus? 1989, like a Conalime. Like, no, oh, it was boy. real shitty. It was real shitty. Um, it was great, though, man. I loved it. Um, I mean, me and my buddy, like, we bought an RV. I mean, because I was working remotely for Coindesk at the time, and I was like, why the hell am I waking up in that home every day? It's like, I did. my company literally doesn't care about Where were you living, New York? Uh, I was out in uh, Cape. I was actually out in Cape Cod. My parents were out there. Uh, okay cool so i was actually just there and i was like look i'm just gonna go and i'm just gonna like travel around and like whatever and it's like you know but like that also struck me because i think that sort of like reinforced my belief in like crypto stuff because i was like wow my entire job as a journalist basically just takes place through technologies that were just like only recently created <laughs> you know it's like it's like I, I i use wi-fi like i do all my stuff on you know documents and all this stuff and it's like that would have been just like unthinkable and i think that sort of like reinforced like kind of me just thinking cryptocurrencies were, were cool. what what's your favorite city in america um I give you like my most, the travel most underrated cities um which is probably more fun uh underrated idaho boise really like boise really why i don't know it's a fun place like kind of small got all like kind of weird um good stuff i like new orleans a lot charleston i never would have gotten then i have to go to charleston it's right it's so close to me i go to nashville a lot weird, like political context now but great city like beautiful to walk around um savannah uh, I, did, I didn't i didn't stop in savannah but um did you travel the south at all, Florida? Uh, I did. I actually spent some time out uh, in the Everglades, which was great. <laughs> Loved it. Um, I was out on St. Petersburg. Well, I went to the Bitcoin Bowl in the RV. Oh, yeah, in St. Petersburg. I live like, I'm like 30 minutes south of St. Oh, Peter. really? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, but uh, I think like, you know, America is super, super cool place. I, I'm endlessly fascinated by America, um, I guess in the same way that I am. It's about Bitcoin generally, I think, or cryptocurrencies. I think, like, you know, I don't know. I've, I've come to view cryptocurrencies as this weird thing, like democracy, right? It's like this kind of like vague, abstract concept that we're probably, I'll probably always will be fighting for in some way. Are you comfortable? Are you comfortable in your, um, you know, there's this term in Judaism called the wandering Jew. <laughs> and we, we, it's the term that I would label myself for a long time because I didn't, you know, you have your beliefs and everything that you're growing up. And this will be the last question I ask you. It's, I have these beliefs growing up, but then it's okay to, to wander and to start questioning. And then eventually you, you settle down and you become comfortable and happy in your beliefs of your religion or whatever it is. And, and you're comfortable with that. So if people come to you and, and with a very strong counter argument, it's not that you're very well versed on being able to respond to that, but you're comfortable in your opinions and in your beliefs, even though you may not understand them yourselves, are you comfortable? Are you wandering crypto? Or are you comfortable in your beliefs at this point? Um, that's a good question. I think I'm comfortable in my beliefs about crypto. I think I've I've come to believe that like I I've come to believe like that the industry is going like generally in the right direction, and that you know I think I'm 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 I remain excited to see what comes out of it. Um, and I think I what I strive to do is to you know, as I said, like, I was living between the two times. It's like, I try to keep that in moderation, you know, and uh, I, I sort of have this thing that I say at Coindesk, it's like, uh, so to people who are new, as a startup move fast, like very slow. It's like, you sort of look back two years, and you're like, wow, we got a long way from there. But then the day to day is really hard, right? It's like, oftentimes, you feel like everything's really static. Um, so I, I guess, like, I, I remain intellectually curious about cryptocurrencies. And I remain like, very, like, interested in Stimulated. Yeah, and remain interested in talking to people who do. I think well, where I get sort of upset with the current state of things is I think that, um, you know, there's there's sort of that maybe a little bit in this down period, we're just a little sour right now. And it's just like there's we've kind of lost a little bit that like, you know, in the willingness to like tear people down, we've sort of like lost this sort of, you know, as you were saying, sort of the grand aspiration, right? We're all kind of we are all still doing something that's very obscure. That is, we are still doing something great. Yeah. Agreed. You know, I think it, 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 it like all in our own ways, right? Like, and I think that's why, um, you know, I, so one of the things that I really learned to do over time in crypto that maybe I would encourage other people to do, because I think it's been 
pretty satisfying for me is to like go to the people like who I felt like I've kind of been shitty to. Like, so I, David Johnson, we mentioned, or like Michael Turpin, I've kind of gone to them like recently and just been like, you know, Hey, like, sorry about that. Like, I'm sorry you went through that. Like, thank you for like doing, like continuing to think that and like pushing that thesis forward. Um, because you like helped us. You did a good, you did a good thing. And I don't think enough people will tell you that. And I got that, that worries me, <laughs> you know? Um, or like Krista Rose or something like that. Right. And I said that to him. Krista Rose. Oh, I said that to yeah. him recently. You know, I was like, thank you. I was like, you know, I appreciate you doing this. And I'm sad that you're like, maybe it's a good not point doing this anymore. Um, yeah, no, he did definitely did a lot for the industry, although we didn't like his style. Um, yeah, the style, I, but I think again, the, like the intellectual critique of like sort of the blockchainism was there. And I think, you know, that, that's why I said it. it's like, I think we have to, and I, and I think I've done a good job about this maybe is just like over time, like learning to value the people who have put time and energy in the same thing I have. Um, so I'll give you like Chris as an example or like tone vase or like people like that who like early on, I was just like so quick to dismiss these people. And I never really like thought enough about like what they were providing that was good. I don't know. That's a weird thing to say, but I, I do feel like I've, I've like, no, I get it. In You're being right. crypto for a while, it's like I find I have more in common with these people, and that I that I maybe reacted to them in really dumb ways that I now like sort of regret because like I just didn't. Um, I just had the weird perception, or I didn't like I wasn't open enough to them, or I was I don't know, just like for some reason like I I, I didn't treat them the same way as I treated other people who were like big on Twitter or whatever. So I do I do try to make a point to kind of like go to those people and just say like Hey, thank you for doing this. Thank you for still being around. Or you know, because I think that means something. I mean something to like have a, you know, maybe 100%. we can have a culture where that, maybe that, where that's more persistent. Cause as you were saying like Tony or like, you know, Brock or like, you know, people who kind of like a little exiled right now for whatever reason. Um, yeah. I don't know. You know, nobody's going to be right forever. <laughs> it's like all the time. That's a, that's a great quote to end on. No one's going to be right forever. <laughs> True story. Listen, Pete, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really sure, appreciate man. it. This was really wonderful. Yeah, it was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. All right, it. let's let's catch up offline. But yeah, I really appreciate you having me. And, uh, you know, listeners, I guess you, know, you can find cool. me on pointhouse.com. Well, I'll see you in New York, hopefully, in a few weeks for, uh, for Blockchain Week. It'll be a lot of fun. Cool, man. Yeah, let's schedule some time to catch up. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. New episodes of Untold Stories go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. EST. Links to our Apple and Spotify channels are in the show notes. You can also follow me on Twitter, Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation. See you next week.